today we're going to take an in-depth look at a particular ship's history. In this particular case we're going to look at a ship that was occasionally dubbed Japan's favourite target. No, believe it or not, it's not the USS Enterprise, it is in fact the USS Birmingham, a Cleveland-class cruiser CL-62. Birmingham was laid down in February 1941 on the 17th in Newport News, and was launched about a year later on March the 20th, 1942. So it laid down in time of peace, launched in time of war, commissioned at the end of January 1943. So how does a light cruiser that's only got two and a half years of war to prove itself in become dubbed Japan's favourite target? Well, perhaps some clue as to just how much action she saw can be derived from looking at the list of awards that her crew and herself won. So the ship would earn eight battle stars, and the crew and officers would come away with quite the haul of medals. Four Navy Crosses, nine Silver Stars, three Legions of Merit, nine Distinguished Flying Cross Medals on a ship, <laughs> two Navy and Marine Corps Medals, 56 Bronze Stars, one Air Medal, 77 Letters of Commendation with Ribbon, seven Letters of Commendations without Ribbon, one Gold Star instead of a third Purple Heart, 33 Gold Stars instead of second Purple Hearts, and 795 individual Purple Heart Medals for a total of 994 total combat awards, of which about a third were awarded posthumously. As with all Cleveland-class light cruisers, she was equipped with 12 6-inch guns in four triple turrets, two superfiring forward and two superfiring aft, and an anti-aircraft battery that consisted of dual-mounted 5-inch 38 mounts for heavy AA, and of course, by the middle of World War II, a whole plethora of radars, 40mm and 20mm light AA. For a ship that would see so much action against Japan, her career did not actually start in the Pacific. Instead, her first port of call when it came to naval action was in June 1943, taking part in Operation Husky, the Allied invasion of Sicily, where she was there primarily to provide naval bombardment. In order to increase the accuracy of her gunfire on land, Birmingham put up her two Kingfisher floatplanes. But unfortunately, this was not a very auspicious start to her career, as due to various issues communicating with both the Army and various allies, the Kingfishers suffered just as much from friendly fire as they did from hostile attention. One of them being quite badly shot up by friendly anti-aircraft fire, with a Messerschmitt 109 joining in the fun, and the second one being attacked by a pair of P-39 Aero Cobras that were marked with RAF roundels. Managing to extricate herself from that particular situation with only a single casualty, the gunner in one of the Kingfishers, with Operation Husky over, the Birmingham sailed back across the Atlantic for a brief refit before proceeding onwards to Pearl Harbor via the Panama Canal, arriving there in September 1943. In this period, numerous small US task groups were being used to launch strikes and raids against Japanese-held positions, and Birmingham was assigned to Task Group 15.1. This consisted of the freshly minted USS Lexington CV-16, an Essex-class replacement for the vessel that had been lost at the Battle of the Coral Sea, along with two light carriers, the USS Princeton and USS Belleau Wood. Multiple raids would then result, lasting well into the autumn of 1943, attacking various targets such as Tarawa, Makin Island, and the occupied Wake Island where Birmingham's Kingfishers would once again come under fire as she detached from the carrier forces to conduct shore bombardment operations. This time, however, nobody got killed, as the Kingfisher only took a couple of bullet holes from a passing zero before managing to make it back to safety. By November 1943, Birmingham found herself temporarily on other escort duty, acting along with other cruisers and destroyers as a screen for a tra troop transport and cargo convoy that was heading into Empress Augusta Bay. On the afternoon of November the 8th, Birmingham was accompanied by her sister ship USS Mobile when they noticed about a dozen enemy aircraft on radar. This seemed to be at least a raid they could deal with, 
but they were staying worryingly far away. Then, as evening drew on, a single twin-engined Mitsubishi bomber showed up, and started to circle. Just after seven o'clock as the sun had set, the other Japanese aircraft suddenly turned and made a run at the American cruisers, hoping to come in under the cover of darkness. Birmingham and Mobile fired off multiple flares to try and light up the environment, whilst opening fire with every weapon they had at the incoming attackers. One such attacker appeared to be a D-3A VAL, normally an aircraft associated with aircraft carriers. This had managed to pass inside the effective range of both the 6-inch and 5-inch guns, and the 20mm and 40mm guns now opened up on it. They succeeded in shooting it down in flames, however not before it released its bomb load. Unseen in the darkness, the bomb sailed on, skipped off of the ocean, and slammed into the starboard side of the ship, blowing a 15-foot hole in the side, with the blast taking out, amongst other things, the floatplane hangar, since aboard Birmingham at least, the floatplane seemed to live cursed lives. Whilst the crew were understandably distracted by the new hole in the side of their vessel, to add insult to injury, another Japanese aircraft managed to hit the Birmingham with an aerial torpedo that slammed in at the exact opposite end of the ship, and on the other side, on the port bow, this one for good measure blowing open a 30-foot hole in the hull. The ship was now on fire in multiple places, and had two massive holes blown in it, one at each end. The Japanese had paid dearly for their success, with half the strike now little more than burning pools of debris and petrol on the surface of the ocean, but just as it looked like the damage control teams had managed to seal off and shore up the areas around the two holes in the ship, another Val appeared, deliberately flew over a destroyer that was closer, and dropped its bomb on Birmingham's number four turret, the aftmost of the four. The bomber paid for its temerity with its life, but the damage was done, and the turret was disabled. Whilst it was heavily battered, the Birmingham did retain one vital element, its speed. Whilst the holes in the hull didn't really help, it could still maintain about 30 knots from its original design of 33, and this allowed it to withdraw at relatively high speed, which was pretty important since the Japanese seemed to have taken a liking for attacking the ship that night, and multiple further bomber strikes were attempted as the evening and night wore on. The ship's 5-inch guns claiming two further attackers, both of them Betty twin-engine bombers, in exchange for no further damage, fortunately, to the poor old Birmingham, at least that night. Whilst it was clear that the ship would have to head back to Pearl Harbor for repairs, some temporary patching work would need to be done before they could make the perilous journey across the Pacific, and so the crews got to work, further reinforcing the bulkheads and trying to patch up some of the worst of the damage. They did, however, encounter one major problem, that massive hole in the front of the ship. If the ship proceeded at any great speed, or indeed encountered heavy seas, the force of the water rushing into the bow would put enough pressure on the bulkheads to be a concern. However, of course, the sea is not flat, and thus the pitching of the ship would also induce even more water to enter with a particularly violent motion. This would slam against the shored up bulkheads as opposed to the normal pressure of moving through the water, and it was this slamming motion that might very well spell the end of the ship, as if this managed to force open the bulkheads, if they were moving at anything much above five or six knots, water would simply surge into the rest of the vessel before they could do all that much, and that would be the end of that. And so a clever solution was devised. A passage was cut into the breached section of the ship from the main deck, thus allowing water that was slamming into the hull at speed to be vented out this way instead of into the bulkheads. This did, however, result in a rather amusing spectacle. Every time the ship pitched down, there would be a huge blast of water coming up through the passage and vertically up and over the main deck, somewhat like a geezer. Thus, it comes as no surprise that accompanying ships very quickly nicknamed the Birmingham Old Faithful. With basic structural repairs completed at Pearl Harbor, the ship was then able to move to San Francisco for a much more extensive overhaul and further internal repairs. This included fixing number four turret, of course, 
as well as three other of her main guns that had worn out, and replacing the catapults and hangar. Unfortunately, on the 7th of February, whilst they were manoeuvring her to a new berth to allow further repair work to continue, she managed to accidentally ram the SS Manukai, causing significant damage to the bow that had just been fixed. Well, never mind, at least she was in the right place, the bow was promptly refixed, and she departed towards the end of February, heading back to Pearl Harbor and arriving just in time for March to turn around. As the US was now very much on a permanent offensive, her role was to now be a shore bombardment vessel, something she already had some experience with, and so she would spend much of April and May training for this role, in cooperation with other sister ships, the Montpellier and Cleveland, gradually escalating from practice in friendly waters to practice in hostile waters to what was dubbed a cruiser training mission, i.e. a live fire training exercise, against Japanese forces that couldn't really fire back all that much. The next stage was to find and duel with some enemy shore batteries, which she also managed to complete successfully. With these exercises off Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands completed, it was time to put all these lessons into action by sailing for the Mariana Islands to participate in the invasion there in June 1944. She was given a number of important tasks when she arrived off Saipan, one of which was to use her guns to cover minesweeping operations to allow the amphibious transports to approach closer to shore, as well as fire on general Japanese positions, and most critically, she was one of the ships assigned to support the underwater demolition teams. At this stage of the conflict, although their job description might seem very obvious, the UDTs were also used as beach reconnaissance experts, as they could very easily spot what might need to be blown up shortly thereafter. In this role, on the 15th of June, she found herself shooting up an enemy anti-aircraft gun battery, as well as a shore battery that had been foolish enough to reveal itself. The Japanese guns fell silent after a hail of 6-inch and 5-inch gunfire, and so it seemed that the UDT team could go ahead with their mission. However, with the cruiser merely 3,000 yards offshore, it turned out that it was a trap. There were several other Japanese shore batteries that had remained hidden during the engagement, and these now started to fire on the cruiser, which was at almost point-blank range. However, the Japanese had forgotten one very important thing. 3,000 yards was point-blank range for the Birmingham, but for their own concealed artillery, without the complicated fire control systems aboard a warship, it was a little bit more of an ask. So whilst shells screamed down all around the cruiser, and indeed one of them landed very close, with the blast sending shrapnel through the superstructure and damaging some of the sensitive electronics antennas, the ship's own counter-battery fire proved somewhat more effective, and in the middle of all this gun duelling, the UDT team were able to get ashore mostly unmolested, since the Japanese were all shooting at the much larger Birmingham. After a couple of hours of back-and-forth duelling, one of her shells found its mark and a Japanese ammunition dump exploded. About ten minutes later, another one fountained itself into the air, and the enemy gunfire began to die off. Having successfully recovered the UDT team, the Birmingham withdrew, but then the captain had an idea. After a short conversation further up the chain of command, the Birmingham moved back into range of the shore batteries, which obligingly reopened fire. Unfortunately for them, in so doing, they revealed their positions once more, and suddenly massive amounts of American air cover appeared, quite happy to introduce the Japanese gunners to their lord and saviour, the thousand pound high explosive bomb in considerable numbers. The following days would see her put this shore bombardment expertise to good use as the actual invasion started and the troops moved in, with Birmingham being used as one of several ships to provide direct fire support during the landings and the subsequent operations on the and around the beaches. After a few days of this type of operation, reports began to reach the US forces that a large Japanese force had left from the Philippines and was closing in on the Marianas. Having expended considerable amounts of her ammunition, Birmingham quickly replenished and was put in to Task Group 58.3, alongside the legendary carrier USS Enterprise, her old friend USS Princeton, the light carrier, and another carrier whose name I'm almost certainly pronouncing wrong, the San Jacinto, CVL-30. 
Thus, the Birmingham would get a lovely front row seat for the Battle of the Philippine Sea, also known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. The first day in some ways was actually something of a disappointment, as the Birmingham would repeatedly pick up incoming enemy raids on its radar, and then could only watch helplessly as US fighter squadrons were vectored in from various directions and broke up the enemy formations before they could get anywhere near the Birmingham's guns. There was one brief moment of excitement, however, as five B-5N Kate torpedo bombers swept in, having managed to evade American fighter cover, but, well, five relatively slow torpedo bombers against a battle-hardened cruiser like the Birmingham, and it was very soon Birmingham 5, Japan 0. As the Japanese had begun to fall back overnight, there wasn't even an air raid to liven up the second day, the drama instead came from the fact that the Japanese forces were detected somewhat late in the day, and 200 plus aircraft were launched in a strike that would eventually take out a single Japanese light carrier. Unfortunately, they had to come back as well, which meant that by the time they arrived, it had gotten dark. The carriers did their best to get their pilots back by turning on all their deck and searchlights to give the pilots something to fly towards, whilst Birmingham would also illuminate the area as best it could, and in its position as an escort would stream behind the carriers with life rafts already in the water to try and help any aircrew that had had to ditch. With the Japanese fleet seen off, it was back to shore bombardment off of Saipan and Tinian over late June and early July. Birmingham continued to refine its shore bombardment techniques, utilising white phosphorus shells to set fire to vegetation, which helped to flush out Japanese troops, as well as finding three Japanese tanks wandering along in open sight, and introducing them to the idea that perhaps wandering around in the open when there's a very angry light cruiser just offshore is not necessarily the world's wisest move, albeit that the tanks didn't really last long enough to pass this lesson on to their comrades. Another feature of these shore bombardment missions was the fact that the waters around the islands could actually get very deep very quickly, allowing the ships to approach much closer than they would otherwise have been able to do had they been attacking a land target that was somewhat larger, such as is often found in landings in the Mediterranean or Northern Europe. And this meant that at one point, the Birmingham's 40mm gunners managed to get into the action, strafing enemy trenches, as the ship was really just that close. The next item on the US's list of places to invade was the Palau Islands. And in aid of this, the Birmingham would escort the USS Essex, USS Lexington, and the light carrier USS Langley, not the original one, this one was CVL-27, in order for them to make airstrikes against the various islands that made up this particular chain. With those defences having been sufficiently reduced, and then with the intention of deceiving the Japanese into thinking it had merely been a raid rather than a preparation for the invasion that was scheduled for the next week, the task group then moved on to attack the Philippines. The three carriers' air groups blew up many Japanese planes still on the ground and various airfields, and attacked coastal shipping. But on the return from one particularly successful airfield attack, a small Japanese coastal convoy of about 30 ships was spotted. The task group commander thought that perhaps his surface ships had not been seeing quite as much action as they deserved, and so Birmingham, along with the light cruiser Santa Fe, as well as four destroyers, were sent to go in and deal with the convoy the old-fashioned way. Friendly fighter aircraft strafed a number of the larger targets, setting a few of them on fire as it seemed that a number were carrying fairly flammable cargoes, probably either oil or gasoline. Nonetheless, Birmingham and the other ships got stuck in, and within three hours the surface gunfire had accounted for 29 out of the 30 enemy cargo vessels. Further strikes on the Philippines followed, and one of Birmingham's floatplanes, whilst not getting involved in the strikes directly, did at least manage to have a fairly good day by finding and then rescuing a rather wet aviator from the carrier USS Wasp, who had very carelessly lost his aircraft. Strikes up and down the Philippine coast continued, and it was only at the end of September, when fuel and ammunition were beginning to run a little bit short, that they withdrew for refuelling and rearming.
Further raids on the Philippines and on Okinawa followed as, with the successful invasion of the Palau Islands, the focus was switching to the Philippines, with of course the upcoming invasion in and on Leyte. Japanese counterattacks now intensified as of course the Philippines was the last big obstacle between the US forces and Japan, and US ships started to take quite a number of hits, with the Baltimore-class USS Canberra, named after the Australian HMAS Canberra, being hit by an aerial torpedo, followed shortly thereafter by USS Houston, CL-81. The Canberra was towed away by the Wichita, and the Houston was towed away by the Boston, with Birmingham escorting first one and then the other against further Japanese follow-up attacks. As a result, despite significant intensive effort by the Japanese to finish off their damaged targets, the only additional damage that was caused was to the hapless Houston, which was hit by another aerial torpedo, despite Birmingham managing to shoot down the offending aircraft, but Houston luckily managed to stay afloat despite having been hit twice, and both ships were recovered safely. As October 1944 drew on and the invasion of the Philippines was well underway, the Birmingham was assigned to escort a number of carriers that were supporting the landings. Then, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, came a single Yokosuka D-4Y Judy dive bomber. A single Judy would prove to be the bane of quite a few American ships, especially carriers, over the course of this campaign, and this particular infiltrator decided to go after USS Princeton. In a scene that will be eerily familiar to those of you who have seen the video about USS Franklin, the single bomber came sweeping in, dropped a single bomb, which hit the carrier square between the elevators, and detonated inside the hangar. Sure enough, Aircraft, fuel and ammunition began to burn and explode, and the carrier had to heel out of line. In a move that again will be familiar to those of you familiar with the Franklin's struggle for survival, US ships immediately moved in to help. Three destroyers tried to get in close to offer assistance both in terms of men and hoses, but unfortunately heavy seas slammed them against the hull of the carrier, badly damaging them. Birmingham volunteered to move in as at her 10,000 plus ton displacement she was much better placed to take the body blows that slamming the two ships together would entail, and in fairly short order between three dozen men and 14 water hoses one of the two major fires aboard the carrier was extinguished. It looked like it might be another unlikely tale of salvation unfortunately at this point Word was received by the US ships that several more Japanese planes had broken through the combat air patrol, and a destroyer spotted a submarine on its sonar systems only 2,000 yards away. Understandably, the cruiser had to back off fairly quickly to try and gain some manoeuvring room and to clear her guns ready for action. As it turned out, however, only one Japanese plane approached and thought better of it, and it turned out that the sonar contact was probably a false alarm. The Birmingham decided, therefore, to move back in to help the Princeton, which still had one major fire going, but as it headed back towards the carrier, this second fire unfortunately reached Princeton's aft magazines. As half of the unfortunate carrier disappeared in a shower of steel and wood fragments, the Birmingham, which had, as we said, been pulling alongside to try and help again, was subjected to the full force of the blast. Over half of the crew became casualties of war, as large numbers of Birmingham's crew had gathered on the starboard side of the ship to try and offer as help as soon as they got within range. As a result, 233 men were killed, 211 were wounded, and another 215 were lightly wounded by the colossal explosion. With half the crew out of action, the remaining half of Birmingham's crew were now faced with multiple massive challenges. They had to try and put out multiple fires that had been set on their ship by the falling debris, plus they had to gather in as many of the wounded as they could and take care of them, plus there had to be enough of them still left at their stations to allow the ship to pull away from the burning wreck of the Princeton, 
And all the while, the USS Reno and the destroyer Irwin were trying to save what was left of the carrier so that at least as much of the surviving crew as still lived could get into the water and away from the uh, rather large burning charnel house that the light carrier had become. Unfortunately, their efforts to save what was left of the Princeton were not successful, and the ship had to eventually be scuttled by torpedo. The poor cruiser limped in to San Francisco in early November 1944 for another round of major battle damage repairs. The yard took the opportunity to conduct a complete overhaul and refit, overhauling the boilers, replacing various bits of machinery, adding new propellers, replacing all of the 6-inch and 5-inch gun barrels, as you might imagine from all the shore bombardment missions, they'd been fairly heavily used, and of course, because this is the late war US Navy, adding even more 40mm bofers. With flagship facilities also installed, she would be back out into the Western Pacific by February 1945, heading back to Saipan, ready for action. At the end of the month, she was deployed to Iwo Jima to support the landings there, and she promptly got stuck in to shore bombardment duties once more. After being relieved by the heavy cruiser USS Salt Lake City, Birmingham sailed to resupply and refuel, ready for the upcoming invasion of the next target, Okinawa. Whilst restocking her ammunition at Ulithi, Birmingham would witness the arrival of elements of the British Pacific Fleet as two battleships, four carriers, and their supporting vessels, all flying the White Ensign, showed up to help out. In company with the battleships Tennessee and Nevada, along with the St. Louis and Wichita a light and heavy cruiser respectively, Birmingham got stuck into shore bombardment toward the end of March 1945 and was having great fun flushing out and destroying various Japanese shore batteries. Along with this they were tasked with taking out many small ships that were hidden along the shore as it was feared that at this stage of the war the Japanese would be using small suicide boats, suicide swimmers and mines to attack both the landing forces and the shore bombardment vessels. The fear of these suicide attacks by small craft was so great that some of the Birmingham's crew were even issued with rifles in order to repel these attacks if they developed at a range that was too close for even the 40mm and 20mm AA mounts. Intense Japanese kamikaze air attacks, as well as nightly mine-laying missions, both by aircraft and by the defenders of Okinawa itself, conspired to make things considerably more costly and take considerably longer than was ideal. But nevertheless, but nevertheless on the 1st of April, the pre-invasion bombardment commenced. A lone Val managed to make it through the combat air patrols into Birmingham sector, but between a 5-inch proximity fuse shell and the 40mm and 20mm guns, the aircraft was torn apart and shot down, although its bomb managed to land in the water only 50 yards away from the port bow. Birmingham, however, coming out of this particular encounter relatively unscathed and moving in for close-range gunfire support of the invading ground forces. The kamikaze attacks only intensified at this point, and whilst Birmingham would either shoot down or take part in the shooting down of several more aircraft that broke through the defences, there were still casualties, with both destroyers and amphibious assault vessels being taken out by the kamikaze strikes and further vessels damaged. Word then arrived that the Japanese battleship Yamato was inbound, along with a number of escorts, and so Birmingham, along with two other cruisers and ten destroyers, formed the right flank of a hastily assembled force that would have tried to stop the ship had it gotten into gun range. However, the mighty hand of the US Navy's carrier air groups proved to be a bit too much for the Yamato, and it was sunk and Birmingham could go back to shooting things on land. That would pretty much be the pattern for Birmingham over the month of April, but in May, if you can believe it, Japanese kamikaze attacks stepped up yet again. On the morning of May the 4th, reports were heard of a massive kamikaze airstrike coming in from the north. By 5 minutes past 8 in the morning, the radar oper operators were bemused to see a huge aerial battle taking place just to the north, as the US combat air patrols began to take on the massive Japanese air raid. However, 
Despite their best efforts, a number of lone aircraft were slipping through the engagement and heading for various ships. About half an hour later, a pair of Oscar fighters converted into kamikazes approached Birmingham and its compatriots. The first one came in at pretty much sea level and was shot down without much incident, but the second one used the distraction to its advantage and came in in a near vertical dive at the Birmingham. So perfectly vertical was the dive that neither the 40mm nor the 5 inch guns could actually elevate high enough to shoot at it. The only guns that could elevate pretty much straight up were the 20mm, and these weren't enough to take apart the aircraft in time before it smashed straight into the main deck on the starboard side. The aircraft and its explosive payload punched through three decks before detonating, wiping out the sick bay and blowing a five foot hole in the ship below the waterline. Four living compartments, the ship's armoury and three ammunition magazines would all be flooded by inrushing water before the flood was contained, which was probably just as well as there were numerous fires around and, well as we all know, fire and ammunition magazines don't really mix. Despite having suffered 52 killed and 82 wounded by the attack, the fires were brought under control within about half an hour and the more seriously wounded were taken onto ships, boats and nearby landing craft that came to help and transferred to the hospital ship Mercy. Fortunately, being positioned in a relatively sheltered anchorage, the Birmingham, with some assistance from some other nearby vessels, was able to pump out most of the flooded compartments, shore up bulkheads and get some patching in place, and head off to Guam by the following day, May 5th, 1945. Upon arrival, after having unloaded the previously flooded magazines, the ship was moved onto a floating dry dock that had been positioned in the area for just such an event, taken up out of the water, and this allowed for her hull to be further patched and the last few flooded compartments drained. With these temporary measures in place, she was able to make a relatively easy transition to Pearl Harbor for June 1945, and would spend about a month there having the final repairs and alterations made that were necessary to bring her back into full operational service. With this completed, she headed south to Wake Island, which was one of the various Japanese holdings, including truck, that were completely useless to the Japanese defences as they'd been bypassed and isolated by US forces in order to exercise her guns somewhat. But then news of the Japanese surrender arrived in the middle of August, and this operation was cancelled. Instead, she headed over to Okinawa and then mainland Japan, before being assigned as the flagship for American forces in Australian waters, prompting a quick 180, upon which she sailed down to arrive off Brisbane, Australia, on the 23rd of September. After five months on station here, she would return to San Francisco in March 1946, moving on to San Diego in April, and deactivated into reserve in October of the same year. Despite having only seen around three years active service between commission and decommission, the simple fact of the matter was that the US Navy had many, many more modern cruisers that had been brought into service after her, and so although she remained in reserve until 1959, she was never recommissioned and was instead sold for scrapping on the 13th of October 1959 to the National Metals and Steel Corporation. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.